larger scale that we wanted it to test it out at the community level and they told us can you do it and how fast and I was like yes and okay I couldn't do it if you can yeah. wrap up your conversations we're gonna get started with the next panel thank you so much so Oh, I'll introduce myself again. My name is Ashley Winning. Um, I'm the Vice President of Research and Evaluation at Empath. It's really wonderful to be in person with you again. And in this panel that I'll be moderating, we're talking about giving people money with no strings attached. Um, we're talking about guaranteed income. Guaranteed income redistributes wealth to people who need it most and to those who've historically been impacted by lack of opportunities largely people of color. Um, guaranteed income is a no-strings-attached cash, cash assistance that's meant to, meant to supplement rather than replace the existing social safety net. And the income is for recipients to spend based on their own personal needs and choices. Um, it's becoming increasingly popular across the US as an approach to increase racial equity, boost economic security, and improve outcomes for families and children. You, some people may have heard uh, different terms thrown around. Universal basic income is another co uh, term that was really made popular in the US at least in the Democratic uh, 2020 candidacy of Andrew Yang. And, and the different universal basic income is similar but it's about um, a set amount of money to everyone regardless of income or need. Um, so the subtle difference there. And, but both universal basic income and guaranteed income, the idea of giving people money, has gained popularity um, and sort of attention also through the, the pandemic um, based on the increasing needs that we, we saw in this country. So the first um, and most high profile mayor-led guaranteed income experiment in the US was in Stockton, California. The Stockton Economic Empowerment Demonstration called SEED launched in February 2019 by former Mayor Michael Tubbs, and it gave 125 randomly selected recipients $500 a month for two years. The, uh, the findings from this experiment uh, are impressive, and there are many, but for the sake of time, I'm just gonna um, share them in tweet form, a uh, tweet by Mayor Michael Tubbs himself. So the guaranteed uh, uh, income results from Stockton are in. Employment and, pro and productivity, upward arrow. They went up. Well-being, up arrow. Uh, stress went down, down arrow. It allowed people to pay off debt, and the money was spent on necessities, basic necessities, food, clothing, utilities, not on drugs. Um, importantly, it alleviated financial scarcity, creating new opportunities for self-determination, choice, goal setting, and risk taking. It improved dignity and agency. One participant in that program said, before seed came along, I was paying a lot of bills and I didn't know how I was gonna eat. It's like being able to breathe. But what does a guaranteed income program look like in practice? And how can cities and communities implement guaranteed income programs themselves? And what are we learning from this work on the ground? And fortunately, I have three wonderful panelists here who have done the work um, and are doing the work. We're gonna hear from the three of them today. They've been involved in the planning and or implementation of three guaranteed income projects of various size, scale, and level at the community, kind of grassroots, and city level, and at various stages of implementation. So one that is, has completed, uh, one in a year in, and one that's recently launched. And as a FYI, as an aside, your moderator here has also been involved in the very in the pre-launching phase of a randomized control trial with several of your fellow attendees. Shout out to my Texans <laughs> in the house, and we'll talk. We can talk a bit more about that at the end. But another project about to launch. So, uh, Lourdes Alvarez is the communication and community outreach manager for the city of Chelsea, Massachusetts. During the pandemic. Lourdes coordinated the Chelsea Eats Food Debit Card Program, which is the largest uh, debit card program in the country. And just a little plug for later, uh, at the end of today, we're filming, um, sorry, screening a film that goes into detail in that program. Next, um, Melody Valdez is Chief Program Officer at United South End Settlements in Boston, 
an organization that began piloting a grassroots guaranteed income pilot called STEP, striving toward economic prosperity last October, so a year ago. And at the end, last but not least, our, our Beyonce, <laughs> uh, Joseph Jones is founder, president, and CEO of the Center for Urban Families in Baltimore. He's also the co-chair of Mayor Scott's Guaranteed Income Pilot in the city of Baltimore, the Baltimore Young Family Success Fund, which uh, launched in the spring. So I'm going to give them each a chance to introduce their, their guaranteed income programs in order from most mature to the newest. Um, and then I'm going to dive into kind of a series of questions about logistics, barriers, learnings, and next steps. And then we'll open it up to, to the audience for questions. So thank you, thank Ashley, you for the introduction. And um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Lourdes Alvarez. And I've been living in the U.S. for the last four years, and I spent three of them in a city that it was the hardest hit community in Massachusetts in 2020, and that's Chelsea, Massachusetts. So since then, um, I've been working on communication and community outreach, and today I'm here to talk about the Chelsea Eats program that is a 6.3 million debit card program that serves over 2,000 households within the city of Chelsea. So I want to share um, some of the background on how we ended up talking today about Chelsea Eats. So back in March 2020, when the pandemic hit in the city, uh, we found that so many residents that were living on pretty much a, a weekly uh, paychecks, they, they lost that, that income. So to put this in perspective, Chelsea, it's a community that is mostly Latino. We have around 68% uh, of people that have been born in a foreign country. Uh, and this community also, it's around 80% of essential workers. What it means when you are sick, you have no rights and no payment. So the city, um, created what it was called the pandemic response team and there were several groups and one of those was the food insecurity. For several years uh, we have organizations like the Salvation Army that has been in Chelsea doing a great job. We're distributing food but more pop-up food pantries uh, started to, to you know start distribution. Uh, one of the biggest one was also La Colaborativa that you will see on the documentary. And the city also decided to be in the business industry. And we have two food pantries a day, uh, five days a week. And we had that for over six months or, or so. It, it was a, a huge um, operation. So the city is decided to support the local food pantries. But at some point, my boss say we had to get out of the... Uh, food industry because we are not a food pantry. I need you back in, in my office. So <laughs> I was also coordinating the food pantry back then. So what it's, there were a lot of conversation about, among several people in the community and this idea was simple. It's let's start a program that it can replicate what the ABT car is or what the food, uh, there were some uh, food pantries that uh, they were giving away, away uh, gift cards. So it was like this sense that people can get what they need, when they need. Um, during the food distribution, there were complaints like, oh, your box has so many potatoes. And it's, well, but it's the, the thing that we can keep refrigerator. So there was a huge need for milk, for eggs, for ham, other products that we were not providing with um, with the boxes of food. So that's why this simple idea was like, let's create a program that we can transition in, in a gentle way where we can keep assisting our residents in need and they will receive something to survive um, the month. And that's what Chelsea restarted. And we decided that it, the eligibility criteria was Chelsea residents, we didn't ask for any proof of income. So the application was very simple. It was one page, 10 questions, and people um, couldn't apply even they, if, they don't, um, if they rent a room. 
that that was a huge barrier for so many Chelsea residents that sometimes they cannot even prove that they live in the apartment they say they live because they are subleasing. So we have that reality in Chelsea right now uh, and in so many other communities around the country. Um, so this, the, the program provides a system uh, for nine months and it was because the the huge help that the Shaw Foundation provides to this, to this program. So originally we had funding just for two months and with the fundraising efforts that the Shaw Foundation put in place, we raised the money to expand this program up to nine months. So households in Chelsea received $200 a month if they were um, up to two people and uh, bigger households, they receive $400 a month for nine months. What happened is during the process, we also collaborated with Harvard and they had a survey and demonstrate that by April of 2021, food security was improved on the residents that received the car and set over the 70% of the expenditures were made in food. So we proved that this program was a great help for families. And the funny part is, do you know how, how much money they spend on meat? It was one of the biggest expenditure. People were desperate for, for meat. Um, so it proved that if you give money to people, they will use it responsibly, but it doesn't mean that it's enough. They also complain that sometimes they get a snap and they receive $100. That is not even enough to, to do a grocery shopping at once. So we also have seen seniors that they are doing $800 uh, a month with the social security. So we were not solving the food insecurity that is in Chelsea and is still in Chelsea, but this was a great start and I'm happy to share with you uh, more thoughts on, on how we discontinue. Thank you. Um, thank you, Ashley and uh, Lourdes. My name is Melody Valdez, and as Ashley mentioned, I'm from United South End Settlements. Um, our journey into guaranteed income is not dissimilar um, from Chelsea. During the pandemic, we also were faced with some of the same challenges that families in Chelsea were facing. Our families were experiencing food insecurity. Our families had lost income. The majority of our families were female-led households where families had to take a step back from entering the workforce. And we were at a loss on how to support families. We launched a food distribution program through the pandemic because we recognized that food insecurity was a big barrier um, for the participants in our program. And due to some funding that we received from the city, we were also able to launch a mini grant program. This was a conditional cash assistance program. Um, the city had put together some guidelines as to how the money could be utilized. And there were certain priority areas. So saying if families were experiencing food insecurity, families could use it towards medical expenses. Families could use it towards rent, but these families had to provide proof that they needed food or prove that they needed to pay for rent or that they had a medical expense. And I remember that as an organization, we felt like it was really challenging to put or to place value on some of the biggest challenges that our community um, were facing. We were sitting across from each other, or not really across from each other, we were sitting on Zoom um, from each other, <laughs> having these discussions and being like, does this family, you know, can we give money to this family because they have a medical emergency versus this family that needs it for rent? Like, what is most important? And it did not feel good. Um, fast forward to a few months later, I was at a conference uh, with Ascend, and um, mayors for guaranteed income were presenting on guaranteed income. And I remember listening and thinking, this is the way that we should be doing this. This is how we should be supporting families. And there was a story that was particularly compelling to me um, where the speaker talked about his journey and how he was a WIC recipient, um, but his daughter had a severe peanut allergy. 
but in the nutritional um, diet that was given to him, there were all of these peanut products. And the frustration that he felt when he went to the grocery store feeling like, I need this support. Somebody that doesn't know anything about my family or my family's needs are telling me that these are the products that I can purchase. And he felt really upset that this was the reality that he was living with. Um, so I, I remember living that, uh, that meeting and thinking, we should be doing this, but how do we do it? We are a small organization. We did not have the funds. Um, and then by fate, uh, we had two funders that came to our organization a few months later and said, we are really interested in exploring guaranteed income. We've been hearing about this on a larger scale. We want to know, can you do it with the population that you serve? And I was like, absolutely. Mind you, at this point, I had no idea how to do this. I was like, I can do it. And he's like, how fast can you get it off the ground? I was like, one month. And he was like, awesome. And I was like, yes, one month. And then I left that meeting, and I was like, uh, OK, I'm doing this in one month. How do I do it? Um, but thankfully, I think I, I was able to learn from the lessons that the city of Chelsea had gone through, Cambridge was going through a similar process. So we utilized a lot of our resources in our community to kind of understand how to launch this program, also recognizing that we were not going to be serving hundreds of people, right? We are serving 16 families. Um, and we came about that number because we wanted to give families an amount of money that seemed significant. And we read a lot of literature, looked at other organizations that were doing similar work, and we were trying to understand what is that number. So we landed on $800, um, and given the amount of funding that we had, that also determined the amount of families that we were able to serve. So we are giving families $800, 16 families, $800 for 18 months. The next part of this process was who? Who becomes eligible for this program? United South End Settlements is an organization that serves children and their families. We have a two-generational approach um, to early education and to the work that we are doing. So we wanted to make sure that the families that qualify for the program were families that had children enrolled in our programs. So we have three programs, an early childhood education program, an out of school time, and a camp. So all the families that had children enrolled in our program would qualify. And then the third part was what are some of the income limits? And we understand that this has been done um, in different ways. Some organizations have focused on families that are at, at the lower end of the spectrum, kind of middle range, or families that do not qualify for social safety net programs. We settled on families that were at 50% or less of the AMI which for a household of two is under $43,000 in the city of Boston. Um, so those were the qualifications, and then we opened the application process. So any families that qualify based on those two things, income and having their children enrolled in our program, could apply. Like the city of Chelsea, we wanted to make sure that the application was easy and accessible. We didn't want families to have to prove their need. We needed families to self um, you know, uh, self-report on their income because we wanted to make sure that they were eligible. But aside from that, we didn't have a lot of hoops that families had to run from. And then we ran families through a randomized lottery to select those 16 participants that now were part of the program. The other component is that we wanted to study the program because even though we're small and our sample size is small, we wanted to see are the other interventions that we have at USCS what's making the difference or is guaranteed income because we understand that it's not the end all be all, right? This is a program in addition to other supports and other programs that exist that's helping to move the needle. Um, so we wanted to study families that were receiving our interventions minus the guaranteed program and then those families that were receiving all of our interventions in addition to our guaranteed program. So we have a control group of about the same size and the composition of the control group mirrors that of the enrolled uh, group. So we are a year into our program and I know we're gonna get into results a little bit later, but some of the things that we have seen is that yes, 
the guaranteed income program is impacting those things that you think it will, right? Like savings, debt reduction, credit building. But the other component is that it's also impacting children's well-being in a really significant way. And I think other programs haven't really uh, looked at that. And for us, it was really important because of the focus of our organization. So we wanted to understand how is it supporting the parents and therefore, how is it supporting the children? Hi, everybody. I'm Beyonce, as you heard. <laughs> uh, really not. Uh, I'm Joe Jones, uh, CEO of the Center for Urban Families. But today, I'm here uh, in my role as co-chair of Baltimore's Guaranteed Income Pilot. Uh, that was the vision for our mayor, Mayor Brandon Scott. And it's important to note that uh, Mayor Scott uh, grew up in one of the more challenging neighborhoods in Baltimore. And he's a, he's a young, dynamic mayor, relatively young, dynamic mayor, 38, 39 years old. And through that experience growing up in that neighborhood is what propelled him uh, into public service. And prior to becoming mayor, so he is uh, coming up on the end of his second year of his first term. Uh, and prior to then, he was city council president. And, uh, and I've known him for quite some time. And he's always talked about equity and thinking about the conditions in Maryland, and Baltimore in particular, that historically have caused disadvantaged families and individuals from those families to be born starting behind the starting gate. And what could he do uh, as he evolved uh, in public service to address these issues? So he approached uh, myself and a colleague, uh, Danielle Terrain, who is the executive director of the Open Society uh, Institute Foundation in Baltimore, and asked us to co-chair uh, a steering committee that would uh, develop a set of recommendations uh, for him to consider uh, as a guaranteed income pilot. Uh, there were no constraints on us in terms of what uh, we could envision. He also didn't have any money, right? So he said, uh, this is the, this is the, the marching orders and, and come back and let me know. And so the steering committee was comprised of a cross-section of Baltimore stakeholders from people in the nonprofit sector, uh, folks in philanthropy, folks in the research and evaluation community, folks with lived experience and community voice, and others, and uh, we really thought through what are the different populations, given that this is guaranteed income with no restrictions, how could we develop a recommendation around a target population that would be most impactful that we could learn from? And keep in mind, the North Star for this work uh, for the mayor is that he joined Mayors for a Guaranteed Income, inspired by Mayor uh, Tubbs. And that North Star is to have the work of the mayors who've joined the network to have the work inform public policy so it becomes a part of federal investments to families, right? That's the North Star. And so we thought about, you know, senior citizens, returning citizens, uh, folks, young people aging out of foster care. Uh, we thought about, you know, you know, non-custodial parents, fathers, but ultimately we settled on young parents, 18 uh, to 24 year old, 24 years old, Baltimore City residents who were at or below 300% uh, of the federal poverty level. And we then uh, started to think through, okay, how do we want to engage the broader community? So we held a number of community conversations. This is all, you know, during COVID, so this is, you know, virtual convenings, but we wanted to hear community voice. And you know, one thing, uh, Anthony Barrows is here, who is, uh, he and I are Ascend Fellows, and uh, one of the things that Anthony has always talked about is this notion of deserving, who's deserving, who's not. And you would hear people make some very disparaging comments about people who they perceive to be, hey, just give people money, right? Uh, and uh, we weren't concerned about that. We wanted to allow those voices to come in and to help them to have an appreciation for how all of us, at some point or another, have to lean on somebody else, right? And so we made the decision that 
this group of young parents, uh, 18 to 24, would be our target population. But we were very insistent that it be inclusive of fathers, right? It would absolutely have to be inclusive of fathers. And that's always a struggle in our society to figure out when we think about families, uh, it's, it's almost historically been a challenge to broaden the notion and definition of families to include dads. So we wanted to, to do that. And so we, uh, we, uh, we launched an uh, application uh, in, uh, in May, and uh, we received uh, over 400, excuse me, 4,000 applications, right, for a fund that would provide $1,000 a month for 200 individuals, right, uh, young families. And uh, out of that 4,000, we selected uh, 200 uh, recipients. Uh, 30 of those uh, 200 are in what's called a storytelling category. These are folks that we want to engage with and have them tell the story about their experience receiving guaranteed income that then helps to inform the public perception about who human beings are that are benefiting from this. The other 130, uh, will, uh, they will be administered uh, qualitative uh, interviews as well as quantitative surveys. And so we'll, uh, we'll have information on those folks you know, over the, the coming months. We, in August, uh, August 15th, uh, the 200 folks got their first payments, right? Uh, the other partners in this work, uh, in addition to the mayor's office, is the Maryland uh, cash campaign. And it's really important to think about them because we wanted to uh, give some consideration to how this, how this program will be administered. Across mayors for guaranteed income, you got some folks where mayor's offices are actually the administrating entity, where others, they've outsourced it. And for us, we thought hard, hard, long and hard about who would be the best entity in the Maryland cash, cash campaign. We accepted their proposal. And they focused on financial education. They also oversee volunteer income tax assistance sites in the state of Maryland, and they do benefits counts. So they were the right kind of entity. Steady is uh, also a partner. Steady is a financial uh, company, uh, and they administer the payments, right? Uh, we also have, uh, as I mentioned, this is a randomized controlled trial. So we have our evaluation partners, which is uh, APT Associates, uh, Mayors for Guaranteed Income Research Center, and Johns Hopkins University. Uh, Dr. Lorraine Dean from Hopkins, who's a member of the Stern Committee, is helping us to think through this in Baltimore. Our process of you know, understanding how we wanted to think about the design, the selection, and implementation came through leaning on mayors for a guaranteed income the network, but also the research center. So we were able to engage with other cities across the country who are, whose work is you know, further along. Uh, but we were also able to uh, engage with researchers on the research team that study the, uh, the Stockton model. And uh, as you heard, you know, some of the early considerations coming out of Stockton were you know, people who were receiving guaranteed income, their employment rates increase, right? Not decrease, right? Uh, in Baltimore, when uh, the folks from the cash campaign called the, the folks who were selected for the treatment group, they had parents who were who on the phone crying, right, because they couldn't believe that they were getting matter of fact, some people actually hung up on them because they thought it was a scam and they had to call them back, <laughs> right? Uh, we've also have, uh, in terms of the, the average age is 22 years old, uh, 80, about 82 percent of the folks who we selected are, uh, are women. 12% uh, are, are, are men or dads. And so we're going to learn a lot. Uh, if there's one resource I would give folks, it would be to go to the Mayors for a Guaranteed Income uh, uh, website. It's Mayors uh, for, dot uh, org. So Mayors for AGI.org, and you'll see the information from the various implementation sites across the country, including Baltimore. Our demographic information is on the site now. In the next quarterly update, you'll start to see uh, spending patterns from the Baltimore uh, pilot uh, populated on the site. Thank you all so much. I heard sort of across these presentations um, some of the impetus for the, some logistical hurdles in sort of trying to, 
decide for others what they need or give them that or have others prove their need. And then also, uh, Joe, you brought in the importance of bringing in voice of people with lived experience. I feel like some of these logistical hurdles come from these misconceptions or myths or fears uh, that just giving people money, people will lose incentive to work or uh, um, you know, not know how to spend it. And I think hearing across these, it's, com it's completely opposite. So I'm curious kind of what other barriers or misconceptions you saw out there in trying to bring this up, what you faced, um, and what, how approaches to, to changing that narrative. We, I was just in a great session about shifting the narrative earlier and, and the importance of the narrator. And I know you mentioned sort of the, the, the qualitative aspect of this. So I'd love to hear a little bit more of the discussion on these myths and, and barriers and how you overcome them and kind of what more needs to be done. In any order, go ahead. Well, <laughs> Feel free. Um, I think that for Chelsea, uh, it was a, a, a misconception or how change the mindset, what local government has to do and what, it, what we shouldn't do. So being uh, distributing food, food boxes, it wasn't something that government has to do if we think pre-pandemic. But during the pandemic, it's like, we need to provide food. So now we are producing boxes. But then at some point, it's like, yeah, we, we, we need to stop. Because this is not what we have to do. What we have to do is ask the community, see what they want, and ask the community not to measure the community. It's to know the community. Uh, so for me, one of the huge barriers is how we approach when we talk about assistance programs because we miss the part that people have dignity. So we are not helping poor people, we are helping your neighbor. So that's what also I feel that not having enough diversity mm. at our workplace, mm. I know my neighbors because I live in Chelsea, so they will trust and they will share with me their experiences because I had the same experiences. So sometimes, uh, as the way that it operates, people that is making decisions are not minorities. So how you want to understand a minority if you don't know what it, it feels? So if you want to work with a Latino community, hire Latino people. If you work in a black community, hire black people. But don't pretend that you know the community if you are not even willing to understand the struggle of, of, of others. So that's what I think COVID, it has or it has bring this huge opportunity of understanding and, and again, it's because it affected everyone. So I don't know if it would be something like this possible if COVID hadn't been as, as broad as, as it was. Um, yeah, I definitely um, agree. I think the other part for us is that at the beginning, I remember being really caught up in like trying to disprove, right? Like we wanted, um, the beginning of the program, we used to have families self-report on how they were spending their money because we wanted to disprove this myth that people would, if you gave folks money, that they wouldn't use it appropriately, right? And then I recognized that I was doing that because I wanted to prove people wrong, but not because it was in the benefit of the folks that were engaged in the program. It mm -hmm. was unnecessary paperwork. Mm -hmm. So three months into the program, I was like, I don't need to know how families are spending their money. What I need to know is, is this money supporting families in the way that they need support? And that looks very different across the board. And that was a conversation that we had internally and a conversation that we started having externally where it wasn't, I needed to prove that our families were utilizing the money in the right way. That wasn't a question for me. It was like, how is this money helping our families? And that was the narrative that I wanted to convey. Um, the other piece is that we did not want guaranteed income or this money to replace federal money or existing social safety net programs. So I think when a lot of the families that are participating in the program, we're also recipients of SNAP, where they had housing vouchers, had childcare vouchers. So we did a lot of work in trying to understand and get waivers for this program because this should be in addition to the supports that families are already having 
and not as a way to replace, because that is not measuring a difference. So we had to educate our community also on the impacts of the, of the program. And I think that's the benefit, or what I believe to be the benefit of doing it at a grassroots level, is that we had that trust and that relationship already built in with our community, where we had families that were applying to be in the program or got selected to be in the program, and we had the conversations with them about the potential implications of this money on their current financial situation because we wanted families to make educated decisions that were best for them. And it, that might mean that for some families it didn't make sense, but we also wanted this money to be done in a way that felt dignified and that families felt like they had agency over how they got to spend it. And I think we were lucky that a lot of organizations or bigger entities like the city of Chelsea and Cambridge had already done a lot of the legwork. Um, with the Department of Transitional Assistance or with the Department of Early Childhood Education and Care. So our families were already receiving those benefits and now had these resources in addition to. But I think that was a barrier for us at the onset of the program is to understand the financial implications that this money had on the existing benefits and safety net programs that families were already receiving. Yeah, you know, that I'm glad you mentioned the whole piece about waivers. That's something that I think that, you know, you just can't discount because this will uh, likely have an impact on some uh, recipients, uh, you know, public benefits. And two things about that. One is that for the population of 200 folks that we uh, are working with in Baltimore, about 80 of them were able to receive uh, waivers for public housing so that their public housing vouchers wouldn't be impacted. Uh, but the other side of that is that uh, we also wanted to make sure that people receive financial coaching because this was money that was going to be impactful, but it wasn't forever, right? It's not going to be forever. So although we're at the very beginning stage, we're thinking about what does it mean two years from now when people begin to roll off of this? You know, how can we support them in growing to the point where they're able to leverage this in, 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 in order to grow their families? But the, you know, I think all of us, you know, during COVID, you know, I, I can't speak for other communities. I'm speaking about Baltimore, and I'm assuming this is, you know, germane to other communities where we really tried to help our most vulnerable citizens. And because of some of the disparities that existed around use of technology, access to technology, these things impacted people's ability to receive resources. For us, when we were uh, beginning to work with the families, right, folks did not necessarily have a, a banking relationship. Right? So they had to be connected to a bank in order to be able to receive the benefits. So we had to do a lot of work uh, with them uh, around that. Uh, folks, you know, some folks just didn't have regular use of email. Right? So just think about those basic things I think many of us may take for granted in our daily lives. We had to really work with people. Also thinking about you know, the family composition. We don't know the circumstances in a, person, in a particular person's household. So some people's comp complicated lives with public systems don't allow them to trust enough that they would want to receive $1,000 a month guaranteed that was uh, unrestricted. And so some people opted out of uh, participating because their family situation was too intertwined with other people's situations, right? So those are a few things that uh, I think complement the other things that we heard from the other folks on the table. Thank you. Um, uh, something that came up and again, and, and across these responses was um, the sense that guaranteed income has limitations. It's, it's income is uh, necessary, but not sufficient. And that there are other uh, ways, and this actually came up yesterday in Raj Chetty talking about if you give housing voucher, that's a great resource, but what supports in the use of that resource can be given. So I'm curious for you all thinking of kind of what other services can pair with this. Um, and the other limitation, of course, to the, to the programs we're talking about is they have an end date. So we're providing resources for a period of time and then cutting that off. So I, I'd love to hear your thoughts on the sort of off-ramping and making sure there are these wraparound supports that this doesn't drop off, that that support is continued. Yeah, I, I think for us, we wanted to make sure that the money was not conditional. And I, we have financial coaching being offered at our organization, but we did not make it a prerequisite of being in the program to be a recipient of financial coaching services. Um, 
that proves to be a barrier when you are trying to support families in the off-ramping process. But we, what we have seen is because these families are coming to our organization, um, already have a relationship with us, when they come every month to pick up their checks, when they come to pick up their children, we are able to have that touch point and see how families are doing. And instead of making it a requisite of hey, if you don't engage in coaching, then you can receive these funds. Families are now opting in voluntarily because they recognize that this has been a major shift in their financial situation. Now they have this money that they didn't have before, and at the beginning it was really exciting, and then it's like, what am I going to do? Because families also recognize, right? Like, we don't have to tell them. They recognize that this is a transitional support. It's not going to be permanent. So they are trying to set themselves up for success. And they're thinking about college savings accounts for their kids, or they're thinking about savings or purchasing a home. Um, so I think, to your question about what other supports, I think guaranteed income is one piece of the puzzle this morning folks were talking about uh, the importance of early childhood education and thinking about access, right? Like how are we ensuring that families have access to quality early childhood education and care? Um, what are we doing about our voucher and contract programs and systems that currently exist? Food, food is a basic need that every person in our society should have access to. So in addition to the guaranteed income program, what are we doing to ensure that we all, as humans, have access to the food that we need? This shouldn't be something where we have to prove need. It should not be something that we have to fight for. It is a right. So how do we ensure that we have that? Um, healthcare. So I think, and I can go on and on and on, but I think that if we think about the systems that exist, I think this, what this has shown is that, to your point earlier about the housing vouchers and how sometimes that places restrictions on the way that people, or in the ways that people could move or where they can live. And yesterday we were talking about social capital and the importance of the economic interconnectedness. So the guaranteed income program, what it does, right, is that it's giving me the money so that I can choose where I want to live. And maybe I want to move into a neighborhood that is more affluent than where I'm currently living, and I'm giving my children an opportunity to maybe meet and make connections with children of other socioeconomic status. So I think what is giving families is flexibility, but it is not replacing the things that every family should have in order to ensure that their children have access and opportunities. Yeah, I'll just add one thing that, you know, cause Melanie added a lot here. Uh, one area that we want to explore through the evaluation is measuring hope, right? How do you have somebody believe mm -hmm. that, like, because this is coming through the mayor's office, right? How do you get a person to believe that my government is actually supporting me in an authentic and a caring way, right? Uh, how do you get a person to believe that, you know, here are resources that are being made available to, available to me and I can use them however I want? And people are making really, really sound basic decisions. Like, I gotta start a car and my car, I've not been able to get it fixed because of a $200 bill. Right? And therefore, I can't get to work efficiently. I can't get to childcare efficiently, efficiently. So how does that inspire hope? You know, so how can we measure that so that we can have more people to understand? This ties into the North Star in terms of how can we ultimately get these guaranteed income pilots to roll up into federal uh, policy, not dissimilar to what happened when we explored as a country an investment in the, ch the child tax credit, where we had poverty precipitously right, reduce with these investments, but for whatever reason, we didn't have enough of what it took to extend those child tax credits when we knew it was working. So, you know, this is another battle that we want to make sure we stay at the forefront, and it's good to hear that, that we have these different models that we can share information around that hopefully will inspire other communities to take this up. And, and I, I want to make sure you're clear about how we funded Baltimore. So Baltimore was funded $6 million, right? $4.8 million is coming from the American Recovery Act, our mayor dedicated funding that was allocated to Baltimore. Uh, and the other uh, gap 
uh, or the other delta in there was funded by uh, private philanthropy. Great. Um, I, you mentioned the measuring of hope, and I wanted to um, give those of you who have had findings, initial findings already from the um, study, a chance to talk about um, any early learnings or early findings. Melody, I love that you were saying you kind of switched in how you were measuring for, for what purpose to, to better serve, to, to, under, you know, to prove people wrong versus better serve the families you're serving. Um, and, and I know as a researcher, you know, I know that measurement uh, is a burden um, on the families. <laughs> I see a lot of heads nodding here. <laughs> a challenge. Um, but there's importance to it, both in shifting narrative and then in, in, better, in providing better service. So I'd love to hear kind of how you're going about that and any quick, and I'm aware of time, I, I know there are going to be a lot of questions, so maybe quickly just if there were any initial learnings um, from how you're studying this or what you're expecting to see. Oh, you want me to start? So we measured how it, our families savings increasing? Is their debt decreasing? Are they increasing their credit score? But as I mentioned earlier, we also mentioned the impact that it had on their kids. So we're seeing um, an increase in our control group, right, in their savings. We're seeing a reduction in their debt, particularly credit card debt. But one of our most interesting findings came three months into the program. So at baseline, we asked our parents how often they read to their kids every night. 7% of the families enrolled in our program said that they read to their kids every night at the onset of the program, at baseline. Three months in, that number had increased to 31%. 31% of our parents were now saying that they read to their children every night. And as you were talking about measuring hope, we were also asking parents, has their stress been reduced? Do they feel anxious about where their next meal is coming from? And we saw a reduction in that, which ultimately led parents to have more bandwidth to be able to spend time with their kids, to be able to sit down and read to their kids. And sometimes we don't recognize that that's a luxury that many parents in our community do not have access to and would like to, but work, but being preoccupied on how they're gonna pay their rent, where their next meal is coming from, takes away from their ability to be able to sit down and read to their children. So for me, that was one of the most significant pieces of data that we gather from our pilot so far. Yeah, for Chelsea, uh, we proved that people was spending money for the right purposes, so they spend it in food. Um, the, the survey that Harvard uh, did, the, the outcomes will be released uh, this December, I think, so you, you can get more access to that. But something that we will never be able to measure, and it's equally important, is the trust. Mm. That right now, the community believe in us, and as a government, that should be our priority. At this point, I don't think that no one cares in City Hall if they spend the money the right way or not, but they are coming to us when they need help. Mm. And that is something that doing community outreach, I cannot pay for that. <laughs> and also, we created the momentum because right now in Chelsea, no one can overlook the community. So as part of Chelsea Eats, there were so many other programs, uh, assistant programs that we didn't have in the past. And right now, everyone has a sense that we need to support the people that is in need because everyone that was in need was there before the pandemic, but we were doing nothing for them, or we were doing very little. So those are the things that as local government, I cannot measure and I cannot value, uh, mm -hmm. and, and it's one of the outcomes that I'm, I'm very grateful for. That's great. Great. So I, I'll open it up unless you wanna, I know you just launched your program. No. Nah. <laughs> nah, okay, good. You'll have something to say later. Yeah. Okay, good. So let's open it up to all of you. I see hands over here, and there will be people. Just wait, if you could wait till the mic comes to you. Great, thank you. And another hand over there. Hmm. 
Hello? Oh, yep. This is working. Hi. Uh, thank you for a great discussion. Um, my question is directed towards Mr. Jones. Um, I'm very interested in the uh, mayors for a uh, guaranteed income coalition that you mentioned. My question is... Um, how would you ideally pr approach a potentially supportive mayor about bringing guaranteed income to the city? And would you have any suggestions to deal with potential pushback from unsupportive constituents? I'm sorry, can you repeat the first part of your question again? Yeah. Um, how would you ideally approach a potentially supportive mayor about bringing guaranteed income to their city? Well, you know, I'm not a mayor. Uh, <laughs> never even played one on TV, right? But, uh, you know, I think that the, the work that is represented by mayors of a guaranteed income. And particularly when you go to their website, and if you could share that with you know, your mayor, uh, and I, I will also tell you that the mayors have been very, very open to talking with their counterparts. And when Mayor Scott you know, said that, look, this is something that I want to explore, other mayors from around the country you know, they made themselves accessible to us, right? They invited us to convenience. We were able to engage them. So they're very open. They're very interested in that North Star, how this can become, uh, you know, federal policy. So one thing is to make sure that they're aware that this, this network exists of their peers and this resource that their peers have set up, not just the, the Mayors for a Guaranteed Income, but the Mayors for a Guaranteed Income Research Center to make sure that they understand that there are very, very rigorous evaluations attached to this work that will help make the case for why uh, this work is important and what we're learning from it. I'm just going to fill the time while the mic's making its way over. Oh, good, it's there. <laughs> <laughs> I have back. <laughs> I'm really interested if you might critique uh, something that's happening in one of our uh, areas in, in Washington state. It's not a true guaranteed basic income, but it feels similar. Um, we have an area that is offering like full coverage of all your costs for college or apprenticeship, uh, and then plus $1,000 a month cash uh, as an incentive if you continue on that path. Uh, and I know that's not quite exactly the same, but it's $1,000 a month uh, cash for the, as long as it may take to, um, to complete uh, a, an educational pathway. Um, I just wonder your thoughts on that. I, I can take a stab at this. Um, so I see... I guess I see the value if it's beyond college. You mentioned apprenticeship as well. I don't think college is the path for everyone or should not be the path for everyone. I do think that incentivizing in a way that it's actually allowing people to be able to have the luxury of going to school um, is a good way. And we talked about this a little bit earlier, but when in the discussion around the two-gen approach, when they were talking about as a student parent, when you are in school, there are other things, right, that you also need to manage, like transportation, um, like paying your rent, paying your cell phone. So I actually think this is a really great way to ensure that maybe non-traditional learners or non-traditional students could have access to opportunities that otherwise they wouldn't have access to because of other barriers. And I just want to add that Chelsea Eats, uh, they, there are so many people that we don't consider Chelsea Eats as universal basic income program. We think that this is a, a food assistance program. So it depends the angle you pick. And it, it brings me to the idea of um, the wraparound services that families need. Uh, sometimes in order to get access to food, you need to cover transportation, childcare, so many other things that um, I, I think that the title of, of this is just give people money and it should be just give people quality of life. Mm. And this is all it's about. So you can, whatever people need, we need to have mechanism to provide. And it was what also Melody was saying, like we provide what families need and they will use it the best way to do. If it is uh, workshops, that's fine. 
Um, I have a question that's coming from the uh, app. Oh, thank um, you. So this is from someone else here. And thank you for posting. You can continue to post um, through the app. Um, I work for a nonprofit agency on the South Shore of Massachusetts. I think that guaranteed income is great. However, the state tends to pilot these programs in the Boston metro area and nowhere else. So how do we get uh, this into other major metro areas in Massachusetts, like Brockton, Fall River, Springfield, Worcester, et cetera? Advocacy. So every single community needs to advocate. And as I work for local government, but I can tell you the pressure that the local nonprofits in Chelsea put into government. So it's the advocacy. We all should be ashamed of what is going on in the United States that is people that have asked not to food. And we should be uh, asking and demanding this. So if you live in one of those communities, organize, go to your city council meetings, uh, talk with people, and just ask. And just demand what it's, as also Melody say, your rights. Yeah. I would also um, specify that our pilot is 100% privately funded. So I think as a nonprofit organization, if you cannot exert enough pressure right away to have your local government support the program, then look for private philanthropy to help launch the pilot so that you have some findings so that then you can exert that pressure with some outcomes as well. Great. Um, with, okay, we'll do one more question and then I'd love to just give a chance for everyone to have a final thought. So last question, thanks. Yeah, so what do you think is our best hope for getting to true universality of this? Is it through city government? Is it through state government, federal government? You know, what, how do we get from 16 or 200 hmm. families to all families? That's an excellent question <laughs> that I don't have the answer for. It should be probably all. Um, but for me, it's imagine what you achieve given this little amount of money, but what could be if we have better salary for essential workers, access to free education, access to health, affordable housing, affordable childcare, and that is everyone's responsibility. I think that this is something that the federal government is responsible, the state is responsible, and also small uh, local governments are responsible. Uh, you know, uh, sometimes uh, uh, a position or philosophy is to invest in people by investing at the top and hope that it comes down to the community level. Uh, it's, it's, it's something really beautiful that's happening with these guaranteed income pilots, whether they're funded by government or outside of government. It's, it's a bit of a lab where we're learning from one another differently than we've ever learned before in this country. And I'll come back to what we learned through the investment of the child tax credit, right? We now are investing in a different way with the same population of folks who deserve an opportunity to get the best that they can get from their government and from their communities, whether it's, you know, it's private sector investments, it's public sector, sector investments. We're going to be learning about this. And the, you know, the last thing I would say is you know, there, uh, a couple of weeks ago, Mayor Scott uh, and the folks at Apt Associates and two of the participants in the Baltimore pilot uh, were uh, part of a webinar. And you can access that webinar on the Apt Associates website. And I think it's really interesting to hear a urban mayor talking about his commitment to a GI pilot and to hear from our early stage, you know, learnings from the people who are receiving those benefits. So, and we, we should share as much as we can, share information about what we're learning in our communities. We've heard from three, from three of us, right? But Baltimore, we're in the early stage of this, right? So what I'm hearing from my colleagues up here is encouraging for me to know, because it inspires me to go back and talk about this mm -hmm. even more, right? And I know that our mayor is committed to it. Uh, uh, our philanthropic partners in Baltimore are, are committed to it. And how can we invest differently in people uh, who are the folks that we, you know, in some cases, you know, it could be us. You know, you just look at what happened in Florida with the storm. You know, people who had retired and thought they were set all of a sudden had their life turned upside down. That could be any of us at any given, any given moment. So how do we see ourselves and other people? Excellent. Um, and in the sort of spirit of shared learning, I wanted to share 
because we, I'm already learning a lot of ideas from you, and I know there are others here um, embarking on these on these projects. Uh, Empath actually is partnering with Methodist Healthcare Ministries um, and Family Services and Empower House now to launch, um, I believe, the first of its kind, a randomized control trial that is measuring uh, guaranteed income uh, alone with coaching, mobility mentoring, coaching, or financial kind of empowerment coaching alone, and then the combination of the guaranteed income with coaching to see, you know, what the impact that that has on upward economic mobility. And I know if people want to raise their hands that they would love to <laughs> hear ideas from you, you can wave to them later. <laughs> Excellent. Oh, you're all clustered together there. <laughs> um, so I'd love if everyone has um, just very briefly one final thought, what's sort of most exciting or promising to you about guaranteed income, or one thing you want people to walk away with today? Well, I'm, I'm sorry that I couldn't attend all the days, uh, but I've been thinking a lot about the, the name of the conference. And ending poverty is not about money. It's about how we redesign and how we invest in human capital. And we cannot wait for that. So right now, we, we have a mindset that is assistant programs, and it should be poverty reduction programs, and whatever it takes to achieve that. And, and, and take with you that tailoring community investment for the most vulnerable has to be based on the resident needs. So fostering diversity in public sector and in your um, local organizations is the ways to achieve it, like work with local, work with your community, trust in your community, trust in what they say and what they ask and in what they need. Thank you. and hard act to follow. Um, <laughs> but um, one of the things that I, I think that I've learned through this is that it is possible to support our communities efficiently. Um, and I was talking about this earlier, but I feel like what Guaranteed Income Program is showing us is that it doesn't take a lot of bureaucracy. It doesn't take a lot of paperwork. It just takes the right program the right level of support to really help to uplift families. And that again, we should be listening to and thinking about what our communities, what our families need and not dictating what that looks like for them. Because what we are seeing is that the outcomes are greater and more sustainable when they come from the folks that are actually closer to the problem, not from us. Um, and yeah, that will be my my taking from this. Yeah, mine would be is to come back to what I mentioned earlier about uh, Mayor Scott. You know, this is a, a, a young brother who, uh, who said, you know, I want to do this. I'm not sure yet how I'm going to pay for it, but I want to do this. And I want you all to come back to me with a set of recommendations. And I will take it from there. And so it's the will to be able to want to do something like this. You know, it comes back to the question the young man over there asked about, you know, how could he, you know, or how can, he, how can other mayors be, you know, inspired to do this? You've got to share the vision with them about what's taking place other, you know, in other places around the country. Uh, it, it, when you get on one of the calls with those mayors, right, and you see them not as, you know, there's no political posturing. These are actually human beings who are talking about making investments in people in their respective communities. And it's almost as if you're sitting around a, li a living room table with your homeboys or homegirls who are talking about, you know, what can we do with these purchases that we have to make life better for somebody else. And for me, it's about the human condition that allow us not to think about the titles we have, but the people that we are privileged to walk alongside where we're making these kind of investments. And they're telling us what they're doing with these dollars, and it's unrestricted, and it gives them the ability to build their families. And keep in mind, ultimately, you know, for at least us in, in Baltimore, because we're working with young families, you know, with children, right, we are going to be seeing things and, uh, that happen with children who we will never probably have a chance to meet. Right? But the fact that they're going to be better off because we made a decision to invest in their parents is what gives me a lot of hope and, uh, and privilege and, and gratitude for being a part of this with the other stakeholders in the Baltimore GI Power. Not to mention, 
They should have called me Jay Z. At least that'd have been a little bit of a gender <laughs> question. Yeah. Thank you all so much. Um, that concludes the session. We're going to have about a 10 minute break, and there are uh, two breakout sessions. One will be in this room, and another in the alumni lounge, which is down the stairs and, and down the hall. Um, another round of applause for this wonderful panel. Thank you so much. And don't forget to, to evaluate, rate, rate on the app. You can just pop in the session and rate the session. Great. Measurement so, is important. Thank you again to our panelists. And uh, just so folks know, in this room is going to be something about the social determinants of health, people talking about health and healthcare. Downstairs, just one flight down in the alumni lounge is going to be uh, something on workforce. And so um, sort of like good jobs, and uh, what makes for good jobs and, and workforce development kind of stuff. So if you're interested in health here, downstairs is jobs. And uh, back here at the end of the day, we will be doing that film screening. So come on back after your sessions, we'll be back in here. <laughs>